going live. Welcome and thank you for joining us for a timeline of CSB's presidents with archivist Peggy Lanwer Roski, class of 1977. My name is Amy Anderson and I'm the Assistant Director of Alumni Relations. Peggy graduated from St. Benedict's High School and the College of St. Benedict. She was a CSB SJU reference librarian for 25 years before becoming the CSB SJU archivist in 2006. This Benny Day, she'll be your virtual historian as she walks you through an overview of the women and one man who served as CSB presidents from 1913 to 2022. Who were these people and what did they accomplish? Before we begin today's session, please note that there will be time for questions towards the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions for Peggy, please click the ask a question button at the bottom of your screen. You may need to exit out of full screen view to see the ask a question button. Now, please welcome Peggy Roski. Today, I'm happy to share with you some of the history of the presidents of the College of St. Benedict. Since the college was founded in 1913, there have been 16 presidents. Today, I'm going to give you a little bit of history about each one. And if you'd like to know more, please visit the CSB Archives website. Mother Cecilia Kapsner was born in Prussia in 1859 and elected prioress in 1901 for the first of three consecutive terms, during which time the sisters founded the college and built both the Sacred Heart Chapel and Teresa Hall. One of the Centennial Commons townhouses is named in her honor. Mother Louise Waltz was born in Germany and became prioress in 1919 five years after the college was established. During her three terms as prioress, St. Wahlberg's Hall was built as a dorm and needlework department, the St. Cloud Hospital was completed, and the use of German was gradually phased out. Mother Rosamund Pratchner was born in North Dakota and served two terms as prioress and president of CSB from 1937 to 1949. During World War II, she kept the college running as normally as possible. CSB was allowed to found its own Red Cross unit, one of the first college units in Minnesota. Mother Ricarda Peters was born in Minneapolis, was elected prioress in 1949, and oversaw the expansion of CSB into Mary Commons and Aurora Hall. It was her decision to split the duties of the prioress and CSB president into separate roles. Ricarda Hall is named in her honor. Sister Remberta Westkemper, the first non-prioress president, oversaw the separate incorporation of the college from the convent or monastery into two legal entities, a separation St. John's didn't accomplish until more than 50 years later. West Camper, one of the West Departments, is named in her honor. When Sister Remberta became president, Mary Commons and Aurora Hall were new. Enrollment had recently exceeded 300 and would soon exceed 400 in 1959. And the sisters were building new academic and residential buildings for the high school, buildings which the college would later put to good use. These photos show Remberta in the biology lab and indoors, but she also loved to take students out on field trips. After serving as president, Remberta went back to her field work and to teaching biology, anatomy, and physiology. She received the Outstanding Teacher for America Award and was listed in Who's Who Among Women and in the American Catholic Who's Who. She also received an award for Distinguished Service to Science. Here she is in her element in nature. 
And the same goes for this little sculpture. Cradling a plant, seated on a rock, wearing her trusty high top sneakers, notwithstanding the inconveniences of the bugs and the burrs that go with the territory. Rimberta collected and classified more than 600 specimens of plants from Stearns County, creating an herbarium, herbarium for CSB and SJU and contributing to the one at the University of Minnesota. Sister Rimberta took over the presidency, quote, just when needs mushroomed, issues multiplied, and conflict with the local bishop boiled over, observed Annette Atkins in her CSB Centennial book. But that conflict is a story for another day. Sister Linnea Welter served a two-year term as president, during which time a new gym was built, liberating the students from playing around the pillars of Teresa Hall's basement gym. This second gym would eventually evolve into Murray Hall. And in 1963, Regina Hall was completed as the second Mary Hall dorm. Sister Linnea taught for 32 years in the English department, some before and some after her presidency. Sister Mary Grell, a biology professor, dedicated the Benedict Arts Center, oversaw the inclusion of lay individuals on CSB's board of trustees, and initiated a cooperative program with SJU. In 1959, she taught a course on genetics on the public television station. The Sister Mary Grell Teacher of Distinction Award is named in her honor. The cooperative relationship between the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University happened in phases. First came the exchange of some faculty and some students and the joint use of the library, the buses, and the food services. Next came a single calendar and a combined common curriculum, including the 414 program, which included a single course January term between four class semesters. The last phase would focus on cooperation on the administrative levels. Dr. Stanley Adzerta was CSB's first and until now only male president and the first lay president of a women's college in Minnesota. CSB's enrollment more than doubled during his term. Corona Hall, the West Apartments, and the pool were built during this time. The Azerta Community Center in Centennial Commons was later named in his honor. Stan Azerta made waves. Bennyville Revolutions, one headline proclaimed in the student newspaper of the torch. He rides a bike across campus, bums cigarettes, but pays for his own cokes, and can often be seen in the commons just chewing the fat with whoever passes by. In less than a month, he gave the student council a say in almost everything by giving them seats on the academic policy committee. He funded clubs, and he even had suggestions for liturgies. Dr. Azerta also implemented new academic programs in nursing, East Asian studies, physical therapy, liberal studies, and individualized majors. The study abroad program started, and student employees were hired to work on campus. Leading CSB during those days of the burgeoning feminist movement, Azerta is credited with making those at CSB more aware of the high quality of the education available to women at St. Ben's and the benefits to society of the education of women. Dr. Azerta resigned in 1974 to go edit the Lafayette Papers at Cornell University, a project sponsored by the National Archives. But he felt he belonged here and he planned to return. Then he did return here and taught history until he retired. Dr. Azerta, his parents, and his wife are among the few buried in the Sisters Cemetery who are not members of the monastery, an indication of the regard that the sisters had for him. Dr. Beverly Miller was CSB's first lay woman president. Under her administration, 
CSB continued the cooperative relationship with SJU and continued to grow as exemplified by the printing of both institutions' names on the cover of the now joint course catalog. The student newspaper in 1974, Vitae, noted that St. Ben's first lay woman president, though not a feminist by popular definition, believes that a woman is able to achieve anything that she is qualified to achieve professionally and attitudinally. Miller helped the CSB Board of Trustees revise a college handbook that ultimately became three separate handbooks, one each for administrators, the faculty, and the trustees. During Miller's term, CSB formerly established a Bahamian extension program, and the East Apartments and a new student center were added to the campus. Sister Emmanuel Renner led the college during a time of growth in the number of students, the physical plant of the campus, and developments in the curriculum. Despite a statewide decrease of high school graduates with greater efforts at recruiting and retention, St. Ben's enrollment actually increased from 1,760 to 1,960 during her presidency. Sister Emanuel's presidency also saw the development of the CSB SJU joint core curriculum so that all Bennies and Johnnies would get a well-rounded liberal arts education. To serve a growing student body, a gym, library, and another dormitory were added to the campus. Evan Hall was built in 1981 by St. Benedict's Monastery and leased to the college to house students. Claire Lynch Gym was built in 1984 to serve the Blazer athletic teams. And Sister Emanuel led the first capital fund drive raising 5.2 million for the new Clemens Library, built as Sister Emanuel finished her term as president. Later replacing the Adzerta home, shown here behind Sister Emanuel, the new president's home, Renner House, was named in her honor. Sister Coleman O'Connell's background in theater, communication, and higher education made her very effective as CSB's president at a time of greater cooperation with St. John's, expansion of the campus, and new course offerings. O'Connell's Pub in the Hain Campus Center and the Coleman Black Box Theater in the BAC expansion are both named in her honor. Notably, Sister Coleman and SJU's presidents, Father Hilary Timish and Brother Dietrich Reinhardt, continued to expand and deepen the coordinate relationship through the joint core curriculum and joint academic departments. The coordinate cabinet was created, comprised of the presidents and vice presidents of both places, and regular joint meetings of CSB trustees and SJU regions were added. New majors of peace studies, communication, and computer science were added. In addition, the CSB campus began to grow and expand, and Sister Coleman oversaw the preparation of a new master plan. In 1988, Margretta Hall, designated as a sophomore dorm, was completed. In 1989, the main building, vacated by the library in 1986, was renovated. One result was the highly acclaimed Teresa Reception Center. Even the fish pond was renovated outside of Teresa Hall. The Ardolph Science Center was completed in 1992, Lottie Hall in 1994. In 1996, the Hain Campus Center was opened and it was dedicated on the same September weekend that Coleman's successor was inaugurated. As far as I know, Coleman is the only CSB president to have ever run Grandma's Marathon, which she did in 1982 at the age of 55. She was also known to pitch a baseball now and then. Here she is at the St. Paul Saints game in 1995. Or maybe it was just that one time. Coleman and previous president, Sister Emanuel, Emmy, were close friends from their college days together. 
They served in each other's administrations and were often seen around the campus together on their daily walks and occasional rides. Dr. Mary Lyons continued to foster the growth and development of CSB's unique relationship with SJU. She launched a capital campaign which strengthened scholarships, and during her presidency, enrollment at CSB reached 2,000 students for the first time. Dr. Lyons strongly promoted the value of a woman's education and increased the visibility of CSB, which reached the tier two rankings of the National Liberal Arts Colleges. Lyons was also known for her commitment to multiculturalism and global studies. And with a son still in her household, she was the first CSB president who chose not to live on campus. Carol Guardo served as an interim president and was not new to CSB. She had been a consultant on strategic planning and governance and had participated in the previous presidential search. During Guardo's brief tenure as interim president of CSB, she helped establish the coordinated academic administration for CSB and SJU with the support of SJU president, Brother Dietrich Reinhardt, and initiated a three-year task force that examined gender development at CSB SJU, starting by considering what a college for women means. Dr. Marianne Benninger, like Sister Coleman, served 10 years as CSB president. She was charged with raising St. Ben's national reputation. Her term included Strategic Directions 2010, a major strategic planning effort. St. Ben's peak enrollment of over 2,100 students, increased diversity and global awareness, several building projects, and the celebration of CSB Centennial in 2013-2014, which included the publication of this book by Professor, History Professor Emerita Annette Atkins. Besides being a nice photo showing Mary Ann and two of her predecessors, sisters Emmanuel and Coleman, this photo also shows Dr. Benninger practicing what she preached. Quoting from the alum magazine, when she arrived on campus, it puzzled her to see so many Bennies and John in St. John's sweatshirts. And where were the Johnnies in St. Ben's sweatshirts? She simply insisted that if Bennies employed at St. Ben's chose to wear logo clothing while they were working, it must have either the CSP or the CSP and SJU logo. Under Benninger's leadership, the endowment more than doubled. A CSB SJU chapter of Phi Beta Kappa was established, and the campuses moved up in the national rankings. She and Provost Rita Knazel were there to celebrate with the Education Abroad staff when the institutions received the highest award given for campus internationalization, the Simon Award for Comprehensive Internationalization. She and SJU President Brother Dietrich Reinhardt traveled to China to celebrate the campus's long partnership with Southwest China Normal University. That partnership, and one with Bunkyo University in Tokyo, and several other long-term international study, study opportunities for students, had all factored into the Simon Award. By the way, in her 10 years here, Dr. Banninger worked with no fewer than four different SJU presidents. A robust study abroad program went along with efforts to increase diversity on the campus by hosting more international students and recruiting more diverse U.S. students as well. St. Ben's opened an Office of Sustainability in 2010, and Dr. Banninger, shown here helping with the Habitat for Humanity home build, promoted the elimination of plastic water bottles at St. Ben's. Her legacy is also reflected in several building projects for St. Ben's. Renner House, which opened in 2005. In 2006, the BAC was renovated and expanded. The Goretzky Dining Center was completed in 2007, one of the most significant changes ever made to the campus. Now St. Ben's students had a first-class dining space 
located close to their dorms, and the institution had a viable venue for hosting events for those on and off campus. St. Ben's opened its own health center in Lottie Hall in 2009, and in 2012, members of the class of 2013 moved into Centennial Commons, the new student townhomes located across College Avenue from the campus. There are a lot of nice formal images of Dr. Banninger, but she wasn't afraid to pose for silly ones either, especially with Benny's. And this fortuitous pose captured six of the then most recent seven presidents in the monastery's gathering place, ultimately spanning St. Ben's presidential history from 1968 to 2014, almost 50 years. Which brings us to Dr. Mary Dina Hinton. Dr. Hinton brought diversity into the president's office. Besides building projects and improved ratings, she will be remembered most for her commitment to ensuring a welcoming and safe community for all, one with diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice exemplified across all facets of CSB. In response to students chanting, build that wall, on the link and the subsequent student demonstration about issues surrounding diversity at St. Ben's and St. John's, President Hinton went to the demonstration, gave a speech to those in attendance, and comforted students who felt uneasy. She hosted conversations with students about how to address similar issues in the future. And she was an integral part of securing the Becoming Community Initiative, a $600,000 grant from the Mellon Foundation to create transformative inclusion among all in the community. Mary Hinton wasted no time in putting together a vision and a plan for the future, Strategic Directions 2020. This emphasis on collaboration and ensuring that all voices are heard was something that became very characteristic of President Hinton's time at CSB and earned her respect and admiration from the community. We heard the mantra frequently to think critically, lead courageously, and advocate passionately. Her presidency also saw the repurposing of the main building, the Henrietta Academic Building, and three monastic buildings that were recycled to become Schenecker Commons. She also made fashion statements whenever she was out and about. Which brings us to our interim president, Lori Slagle Heyman. CSB's interim president for two years, Heyman was not new to the campus. She had served as CSB's Dean of Students from 1992 to 1996 and was, quote, an integral and inspirational member of student development, a real link to the students and a real person behind the title. The 1993 Saints Yearbook had a full page feature on her. She was credited with devising a new housing lottery system and she also started a program for enrolling and housing single mothers as Bennies stating that she believed it was within our value system to honor single women and to offer them the support they need to complete their pregnancies and remain in school. Despite taking the reins during a global pandemic and serving in an interim capacity, Laurie Heyman and St. John's interim presidents had an impact at St. Ben's and St. John's. They oversaw the opening of the Multicultural Center and the Experience Hub, the start of the doctoral programs in nursing, and the establishment of a new global health minor. And they began the implementation of the new strong integration leadership model, whereby we now operate under two boards made up of common members and have our first joint president. And now both interim presidents have been replaced by that single joint president to provide leadership and inspiration for both campuses. Only time will tell what Dr. Brian Brees's legacy will be and what future archivists will be able to document about it. Stay tuned. 
Thank you for attending Benny Day 2022. Thank you, Peggy. Um, so now uh, we have time for questions here. So I'm going to take questions from the audience and uh, we will kick off with our very first question, which is um, how were presidents elected before the intercollege cooperation began? Okay. Um, the prior S, otherwise known as the Mother Superior in previous days, um, the prioress is elected by the sisters of the monastery, but the president has always been appointed, or you might say selected, not elected, um, initially by the prioress, um, but eventually they were elected by the St. Ben's Board of Trustees once, once the Board of Trustees was established. Um, actually, documentation about that would be in the monastery archives, not the college archives. There's a cutoff there when they were establishing the archives and then establishing the college archives, the sisters decided that everything before 1961 would be in the monastery archives and everything concerning the college after 1960, 61 would be in the college archives. So um, some of the information about the history of the college isn't literally at my fingertips in the archives, it's over in the sisters' hands. So anyway, um, Leading up to the time of greater cooperation between St. Ben's and St. John's in the mid 1960s, the board was technically comprised only of sisters. So the sisters were, were making those calls about the presidency. Um, there was a large associate board comprised of lay people starting in the 60s though. Um, and um, our new joint president was appointed by the new joint board. Great, thank you so much. Um, so our next question here is, how are president's terms of service determined? Um, that's a good question. As far as I know, generally, it's the presidents themselves who choose to move on. Some have gone on to be presidents at other colleges and universities. Some choose to retire. Um, some return to the classroom. So um, I really can't say the board meetings are confidential. They don't, their minutes don't reflect their deliberations necessarily. So to really know why a president is moving on, it, it's something we may never know on a case by case basis. Um, something I, I would mention that I didn't mention in the, in the uh, presentation that I find kind of interesting. If you look at the list of presidents for both colleges, which you can see on the archives websites, both of them. Um, so both institutions had two interim presidents who you know, served for very short periods. And then St. John's had two acting presidents as well. If you don't count the interim presidents or the acting presidents, their new president, Brian Brees, is actually the 15th president for both places. That's just kind of an interesting tidbit that occurred to me along the way that I thought I'd share. Thank you. That is interesting. Um, here's another question, which is, how are the names of the buildings determined? Actually, <laughs> that's a good one. Um, <laughs> the institutional advancement staff, the development people, the people that raise the funds for things like new buildings um, would be the, the people to give the complete and correct answer to that. Um, my understanding, at least in more modern times, um, it's kind of a carrot to entice big donors. Um, so like for X amount of, of donation, we will name this building after you or, or space within a building, or, we, or you can decide who you'd like to have us name it after. Um, so sometimes a building has been paid for by a donor, but they've chosen to name it after somebody else. Um, Examples of, of buildings on the St. Ben's campus that are named after donors um, would be the Ardolph Science Center, Lottie Hall, the Hain Campus Center, um, Goretzky Dining Service, and, uh, and Schenecker Hall. All of those are named after, after donors. Um, but before that, 
the, in the beginning, the buildings were named after what you might call deities, like Aurora, Regina, and Corona are all uh, other names for the Blessed Virgin uh, Mary um, or the Sacred Heart. Uh, then after that, when they started building more buildings, or in the beginning, I should say, the, the first buildings built, which are now part of the main building, we just call it the main building, but, but they were separately, they were Cecilia Hall, Benedict Hall, Scholastica Hall, and Gertrude Hall. Those four buildings are the oldest part, and they're all connected, and we just call them the main building, but they were four separate buildings built at, at separate times. Um, and then besides when they, when they finished naming things after saints necessarily, then they started to name them after important people in St. Ben's history. So that's where you get Benedicta Art Center and apartments named after the sisters like Smith, Schumacher, Gergen, West Camper, which I mentioned in the presentation. Um, Henrietta and Ricarda are named after the former prioresses um, they were the high school buildings initially and, and weren't called after the sisters, but once they switched to being run by the college or used by the college, they were renamed to be Henrietta or the HAB and Ricarda Hall. Um, Claire Lynch Gym, Sister Brian Hall, Renner House, um, O'Connell, as I mentioned, um, was the pub in Haines Center is called O'Connell's in Sister Coleman's honor and the Black Box Theater as well. Um, then when the Centennial Commons apartments, townhomes were built, they were named after sisters as well. So Mary Anthony Wagner and Sister Lois Weedle have townhomes named after them. What's interesting to me is that sometimes the, the first name is used like Brian Hall or Henrietta and Ricarda, and other times it's the last names that are used for the sisters. Um, and I don't know who, who makes that call, you know, why some are called the first name and some are last name. And then Claire Lynch is kind of an exception because we use both of her names. Nobody ever calls it the Claire Hall or the Lynch Hall. It's always Claire Lynch <laughs> um, named in her honor. Wonderful. Um... Another question related to the buildings is, does President Hinton have any spaces named after her? Not yet, but you know, her presidency is, has barely ended and there haven't been any more buildings named, buildings built um, since, since she left us a couple of years ago. Um, I would predict that given her, what she accomplished while she was here and, and uh, her, her affection for the students and their affection for her, and now those students are becoming alums. Um, I think it's probably a matter of time until we have something on the St. Ben's campus that's named after Mary Hinton. I, I think that would be appropriate. Absolutely. Oh, here's a really great question. Um, so college presidents face a lot of criticism both on campus and from outside the campus community. And just like U.S. presidents, some are more popular than others. Can you speak to which CSB presidents have been the most beloved and then also which have faced the most criticism? Hmm. Um, well, we don't have a whole lot of polling detail about that in terms of which ones are most popular and which ones have been criticized. Um, time will tell again. Um, I seem to remember learning from my intro to psych class freshman year from Dr. Alan Davison that uh, opinion polls shouldn't be given the amount of credence that they get, that the, um, uh, the man on the street, person on the street interviews are the least reliable measurement of reality because it just depends on how, how educated a person is and what they happen to know. Um, so I, I don't necessarily want to give my opinion about this question either. Um, but I would say, you know, so if someone happens to be the president when there's a national recession and the budgets get tight and enrollment declines, you know, maybe that will make them unpopular because Things, times are hard, but that doesn't necessarily make them a poor president. It just might make them less popular. Um, having said all that, I guess I would venture to say that um, Sister Coleman had, you know, one of the two longest tenures as president in recent decades. And so she had a long time to have an effect. So she did a lot of fundraising. There was a lot of buildings built. 
She fostered a lot of friendships on behalf of the college. She was a communication and theater prof after all. So, she, you know, her interpersonal skills were beyond measure, beyond compare. Um, so she's considered to be one of our, our best presidents, I think I can say that safely. Um, but, you know, if you compare her to somebody like Sister Linnea, who was a two-year president in the early 60s before there was very many students even, um, you know, you, you can't really compare the two. Um, another one that I think we can be very proud of is Stan and Zerda. I mean, St. Ben's sisters went out on a limb by choosing a lay male <laughs> as president. Um, and right at the time when women's liberation was starting to take off the recognition of women as equals and so on, and the benefits of educating women, giving women higher education. Um, so Stan put St. Ben's on the map, really. Uh, enrollment went up. He, he had, <clears throat> excuse me, he had a standing offer, I, I understand, to the high schools of Minnesota that he would gladly come and address their student bodies about the, the benefits of college education and benefits of the liberal arts. And, um, and then he would use that, uh, uh, those occasions to offer scholarships to the women in, in, the, in the audiences. So that helped uh, our, our, uh, our student population grow too. Whether or not we had the funding to fulfill all those scholarships might have sometimes been an issue, but not, not to my knowledge. Um, so I, I think we've had, a f you know, in doing the research for this presentation, it's occurred to me that we have a lot to be thankful for, a lot to be um, proud of in, in the presidents that have served, served this, the college of St. Benedict and the, and, the, and the Bennies. Was there any, uh, the kind of the second part of that question was, was there anyone that maybe faced the most criticism or maybe they were, um, serving their presidency during a high time of not necessarily criticism on their presidency, but a, a very stressful time to be the president? Yeah. Um, I know there were some that the faculty probably didn't like as well, <laughs> uh, but you see a, a different side of things when you're at the faculty meetings. And, and I was the faculty minute taker for about 17, 18 years. So I, I heard the faculty you know, <laughs> complaints about not necessarily the presidents, sometimes the presidents, but sometimes also provosts and, you know, the people that were responsible for spending the money. Yeah. But, you know, nothing real serious. I, I do, I mentioned in the presentation that Mary Lyons chose not to live on campus. And, you know, it may, probably made sense as a mother to, to make that decision. But I think it seemed to go against the Benedictine value of community and having the president live on campus and be among us 24 seven. So I don't know that that would necessarily mean she was a poor president, but I think in that respect, um, she wasn't as infused with Benedictinism as we otherwise would like our presidents to be. So. Thank you. Wonderful. What else? Um, so, Here's another question. Could you touch on at all about what the conflict that you mentioned that Sister wow. Roberta was involved in? Yeah, that's a very interesting story. And, and it's well told in a couple of places. Um, one is, actually, actually I have this book here. It's in the archives. It's also in the, um, in the library. It's called um, Stories Teachers Tell, edited by Gretchen Hassler, the spouse of John Hassler, the writer in residence for here for many years. Um, one of the very last chapters in the in this book, or the last one of the last essays, is a, is called "The Bishop, the Chaplain, and the Wicked Nuns," <laughs> which gives you a clue there. Um, it had to do with the fact Remberta was maybe the dean of students and the president when the chaplain, who was a Benedictine priest from St. John's, although he wasn't actually here for long, he, I think he was like from another. Um, monastery and was here kind of temporarily. Anyway, he was the chaplain though for St. Ben's and he took exception to Sister Kristen in the English department um, having the catcher in the rye on 
an optional reading list. It wasn't a required reading, but it was listed as an optional reading for her um, American literature course. And the chaplain found out about this and, and hit the roof. And he went to uh, the prioress, who was Mother Ricarda, who tried to tamp things down. And, uh, and the whole story is quite fascinating. He then went to the local bishop, Bishop Bartholomew in the St. Cloud Diocese, to, to say, those nuns, those nuns are teaching blasphemy and we have to put a stop to this. They're getting uppity. And, um, and so it was Sister Kristen's class, Sister Mariella Gable was supposed to demand that she remove it and she refused to do so. So Mariella Gable was in trouble. Eventually it came to include Sister Thomas Carey who taught in the art department because of the work she was, the painting she was making doing. Um, so all this was blowing up and, and a real problem. And, and they demanded that uh, Mariella write an apology, confessing her sins, um, or, or Kristen, I guess, Chris, Sister Kristen had to write that public apology. And um, Sister Mother Ricarda managed to orchestrate it such that she never had to deliver it um, publicly. That was the idea, which was supposed to issue this public apology, but it just never quite happened because though the men, the, the uh, agenda for a meeting was too short, too, too, had too many things on it. They didn't quite get to the apologies. Anyway, um, so Kristen never made the apology, but all three of those sisters were banned from campus for quite some time. Um, and they went around to student dorm rooms, the chaplain and sister Kristen or Mariella, I forget which, and re requested, required that the students fess up and, and give them their copies of The Catcher in the Rye if they had them. So they actually went door to door in the dorms to do this. And some of the sisters, or some of the students said, Catcher in the Rye? Well, I mean, if you're talking about sex and violence and, and that sort of thing, do you want my Chaucer too? How about my Shakespeare? Even the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the controversy took a while to lie down, to die down, and uh, Sister Kristen and Sister Thomas and, and Sister Mariella all suffered the effects. You can also read about it uh, in uh, Sister Sister Nancy Hines edited the papers of Mariella Gable, and she has a long essay in the beginning of it about that whole story in it. That's on the website. I could show that, to, share that with anybody who wants to see it. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a fascinating story and one very few people really know about that that That's happened. A great story. Well, do you know? Um, was it ever like overturned then, where when they were able to <laughs> allow to bring the book back onto campus? Oh well, yeah, eventually. I mean, yeah. I read Catcher in the Rye for my freshman English <laughs> class. You know, many of us did. So it, it we had to get rid of the chaplain first and <laughs> get somebody who was a little more open minded and, and the bishop. Bishop re -tur Bishop turned over to <laughs> got a new bishop. Wonderful. Well, um, we have time for one more question. Um, so, when it comes to knowing and understanding the history of St. Ben's, what one or two other history lessons or areas of study would you recommend that alumni pay attention to? Um, well, if you read your alumni magazine, that's a good way to keep up with what's happening on campus nowadays. And all the back issues are online, so you can read them if you wanted to. Um, the best single source, if I had to give you one, would be uh, one referenced earlier, the Annette's book uh, for, for the Centennials, Challenging Women Since 1913. They're still for sale in the bookstore. I haven't got it online yet. I've got permission to put it online eventually, but there's still copies for sale in the bookstore. So, so go buy one. It's, it's an easy, pleasant read, and it gives you the history of St. Ben's. With Lamps Burning was written before that for the first 50 years of St. Ben's. So that's also online. Um, and if I can share my screen, um, I would love to show the alums some things that I think are really interesting and fascinating that you can see on the archives website if you take the trouble to go to it. So can you see my screen? I can, yes. Okay, so here it's just www.csbsju.edu slash CSB archives, or you can go to the A to Z index uh, and just pull up archives, St. Ben's archives, SJU is right below it. The sites are pretty similar. Um, 
sometimes lead to, of course, different resources. But um, there's, a, for example, there's a timeline you can go to if you want to know when something happened or what was happening during a certain time period. You can choose everything. You can choose just things specific to St. Ben's, St. John's, or specifically joint. Um, if you choose all, all, you get this long list starting with 1856 when Boniface Wimmer first came all the way down to the consolidation and moving offices and services that are, has been happening this year. So the timeline I kind of created it in self-defense because then I have a ready place to go to myself when I get asked a question for when did this happen? Well, <laughs> tell me more about this. And all these things are links to pages that will give you more information in most cases. So you can read up in the uh, or original sources for information about them. So that's the timeline. The CSB history page is loaded with stuff and we've got a lot of things that I've digitized. Here's where you get some things that precede 1960 because they've been digitized. So here's the part about the college that is in with lamps burning. Um, class of 69, Marcia Halligan gave me permission to put online a paper she wrote for her history class on the history of CSB um, in 1968. Here's Mariella Gable's piece on the first 50 years of the college. Um, and if you go there, I think it also links you to Sister Nancy's piece on Mariella's story. Um, a picture book on the history of the sisters, a PowerPoint that was done for the centennial and the sesquicentennial about St. Ben's and St. John's, um, the history of the pageant by Mariella. And then this brief history follows that was written by Sister Emanuel. So there's those that if you just want a, a quick overview, there's lots of things to, to read there. And then there's lots of, uh, there's a, a list of all the sisters that ever worked for the college if you wanted to look up some sisters the faculty in 1969 with their pictures, um, commencement speakers, buildings. If you want to know anything about any of the buildings, these again were created in my own defense because I had whole classes that were assigned to research one of the buildings and who it was named after and so on and so forth. So you can get pictures and timelines and photos of the buildings if you go to that link. Um, just a, a whole ton of stuff is available there under the CSB history link. And then um, if you go to publications, you find all the things that we've digitized going back to the Bennett, which started in 1941, and the college days, which are essays in 1914 and 1915. Normally I can't put things online if they're creative writing because of uh, copyright uh, restrictions. College days is old enough that it just passes the copyright restriction date. It's, it's 75 years or older that, that copyright goes away. So um, that's online. The community newsletters, all the catalogs, all the alumni uh, um, magazines, all the student newspapers, both the ones that were specific to St. Ben's, like the Torch and the Cable and the Vitae and the Independent, that kept changing titles in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and then the record went joint in 2000. So that's also available. Um, Facula yearbooks from 1939 to 1960. St. Ben's had its own yearbook. Then there's a gap until 1977 when it was restarted as a joint yearbook. So St. John's has yearbooks from 60 to 77, but St. Ben's does not. Um, and so on down the line. There's just lots of all this stuff. You can you can look at all these individually and browse them, or you can go to the Digital Archives Vivarium and actually look for a name or a topic or something. You can see I was looking for Dominica Borgardine a couple days ago. Um, so it won't always find every word because some of the older publications weren't done in, in a very font, the, the, the font and the typeface you know, if it was mimeographed or, you know, hand typed, the computer may not read all the letters. So you can easily miss stuff, especially in the older publications. But it is an entree to finding things. It's a it's a lifesaver and super time saver for us in the archives to, to locate information when people ask. So just a ton of stuff. The other, I'll mention one other thing that I really enjoy. Uh, and I, I put up as many aerial photos and campus maps as I could. So you can see this time view over time of how the campus has changed 
Um, I used one of them in the presentation. So going back to the earliest ones, it's not an aerial photo necessarily, but they were pretty high up. I don't I haven't really figured out if they had a really tall, tall tree to take this photo in, in 1900. Um, I think, oh, I know. I think it was from the top of the water tower. The water tower would have been the highest vantage point. Here's another one where there's no water tower from this vantage point. They must have been on a roof or a tree or something. But then there's the aerial photos and you can see over time as the campus grows and expands and you can figure out what the photo date is by seeing what buildings have been built and which ones haven't yet. <laughs> so anyway, I carry on, but I, I love to share this sort of information with students and, and make you alums aware that there's a lot of stuff there at your fingertips. And if you don't find something and you wanna know, just email me, I'd be happy to, to answer any questions that you have, because uh, that's one of the most enjoyable things of being the archivist. <laughs> yes, that's super helpful. Thank you for sharing that resource, Peggy. I appreciate it. And um, thank you for your time uh, and for the wonderful presentation and answering all the questions. And thank you to the audience for attending today's presentation. We hope you enjoyed going back in time and learning about uh, CSB's past presidents. And uh, just want to make a few notes here in addition to the Benny Day activities happening throughout the day today um, and earlier this week as well. Here are some amazing upcoming opportunities to get involved that you can register for by going to the CSB Alumni Relations event page. St. Ben's at Home Meet President Brees will be happening on Thursday, October 6th. This event will feature a live stream chat with our first joint president, Brian Brees. Moderated by Heather Piper Olson, the Vice President of Institutional Advancement, this chat will deliver news from campus, updates on how our Bennies are doing, insights on planning for the future, and reminders that the Benny Sisterhood is alive and well. Then also this weekend, homecoming will be taking place on October 1st. Then this year's Give CSV Day will be celebrated on Tuesday, October 18th. So make sure you keep an eye out for the emails and save the date. Our first year gift program. Um, this year, CSV alumni everywhere are stepping in to help make sure that nearly 700 first year Bennies, as well as international transfer and first generation students feel the love and support of the Benny Sisterhood. The CSB Alumni Association's Alumna and Training Committee is leading the effort to sponsor a Benny branded fanny pack for every one of these students. You can sign up to send one or more for just $5. Join us for an in-person virtual designing your life event featuring Courier Life coach, Katie Selby. This program teaches participants to use the design thinking process to design the next steps in their life and career. You will get the opportunity to consider how your needs have changed in the past two years, ideate three possibilities for your future, and crowdsource ideas from peers for next steps. This program is open to Bennies in all career and life stages, and an in-person event will be happening on October 15th at the Ridgedale Library, and a virtual event will be happening October 20th via Zoom. Celebrate Title IX and St. Benedict's Athletics, the St. Ben's Athletic Department will be honoring 50 of our greatest and most influential student athletes at an event on Saturday, October 22nd from 7 to 9 p.m. as part of the family weekend. We're proud to host this event in celebration of Title IX and pay special tribute to our collective Blazer and Benny history. And along with that, Family Weekend is starting Friday, October 21st through Sunday, October 23rd. Parents and families will be there to hang out with their current Bennies and Johnnies, and alums of all ages will be there to catch up with old friends. There's a ton of activities going on all weekend, so check that out online. Thank you, everyone. Um, I hope you have a wonderful day. Happy Benny Day, and we look forward to seeing you soon. <laughs>